Hey all, thanks for listening to the podcast. Today it's a recording of a book club that I did around my book Flipped. It was a group of uh, all women, as it turns out, in a women's Bible study at a terrific little church called Park Avenue United Methodist Church. And um, they had me in for an hour and a half, a little longer, to talk about Flipped. They spent time reading through the book from... uh, December until now, or January until now. So they spent a long time inside the book. Um, It's a great conversation. Uh, We pass a mic around the room and uh, interact, so I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Like a lot of people, they appreciated the book and felt a little pushed and stretched at times. You know, the subtitle of the book Flipped is The Provocative Truth That Changes Everything You Think About God. And those provocative truths, uh, they don't always land easily. So here it is, this terrific conversation that I had with these fabulous women, and um, I hope you get something out of it, too. I should give you a quick link. Last year, we read Greg Boyd's Cross Vision. Yeah. Did we take all year to read that? Yeah. We took half the year to read Cross Vision. It was long, and it was yeah, deep. Long. And then this past fall, we read Rachel Held Evans' Inspired. Mm. And so your book was kind of the follow-up to those big, deep... Yeah. <laughs> studies so we have been diving deep for more than i should say yeah that's that's a big deal well thank you for for letting me be with you and again thanks for for reading flipped it's um really an honor um i feel like i've known and had park avenue uh, church and community sort of in and around my life you know uh, as long as i can uh, remember i got into christianity when i was 16 and within a couple of years i was working at a church in eden prairie as a youth volunteer and kind of leader and we would bring uh, teams down to support the uh, Soul Liberation Festival oh, when it used to happen. Oh, yeah. So yep. our group would stay overnight, uh, running the second shift, to protect all the sound equipment. Yeah. Uh, so we'd get these suburban uh, high school kids to sleep outside on the stage uh, yes. down here at the, at the Soul Lib Festival. Uh-huh. And, um, and because I grew up, uh, you know, in this area and went to Bethel College and, you know, the, the, uh, Park, Park Avenue is, <laughs> yeah. is well, that right? Yeah. People Bethel. Oh, is that right? <laughs> wow. Am I the only oh. non-native Minnesotan? Okay, well, uh, oh, Joanne. No. Well, what? Joanne, are you native you to Minnesota? Minnesota. Huh? Did, Did you, you grow up here? No. Yeah. Yes. Where are you from? I didn't come. I'm from West Virginia. Oh. We have churches Mountain there, Mama. too. <laughs> you do? <laughs> You're a mountain mama. Take me home. Um... Well, thanks for uh, thanks for reading the book. I, I don't know how you want to talk about it. I'll take that first question you asked earlier: uh, who was the audience, and how do I think about it now? Yeah. Is that is that a good st- yep. starting point? Um, well, I'll start by saying this: look, r- writing a book is a curious process, and anyone who does it, uh, in my view, has some explaining to do. Right? Like, <laughs> like what are you doing? Uh, why why take the amount of time and energy and effort? and then put your ideas into this particular format. And you obviously are well, well suited in reading books, you understand books. Um, it's a strange way to deliver an idea, right? Um, I find it uh, seriously helpful. I do this as a living. This is my ninth book. I have a tenth one coming out. So like I do this, right? Okay, so fair enough, I'm, I'm all in. Um, I do find the one-way communication between an author and the reader to be a bit problematic, though, mm-hmm. uh, truthfully. Uh, it's, um, the author holds all the, all the control, holds all the power, sort of takes an idea and runs it through. And as the reader, you might write something in there, and I see some people have tagged places in the book, or maybe you, you wrote and uh, tried to fight back a little bit, or talk back, or push back, or add an amen, or add an uh-oh, or add a may it never be, uh, whatever it is you're doing. But boy, that all happens, like the author rarely gets to hear, to, to hear that, right? Um, and um, that, so that's a curious thing. So book groups like this, or discussion groups, or Bible studies, where at least you have a chance to let the book be a third voice in the midst of your interaction, uh, I think this is really the best way to do it. I think every book should have to be read out loud with a group of people uh, and make it, make it come to life um, and, and sit amongst you uh, in another way. Um, so so the, the audience, uh, I guess, like for many authors, and certainly for me in this book, the primary audience was me. Right, uh, the amount of hours I spent thinking about these ideas, crafting sentences, having to do the the many kind of organizing 
uh, projects that you do in a book, um, I have found that most authors, when you get right down to it, for this kind of book, and even for nonfiction books, um, for all nonfiction books, even for fiction books, they're, we're, we're writing to ourselves, right? You're, there's something that won't go away, and you're trying to, you're trying to work something out. Um, so most authors are trying to come, to, are trying to get to a place, and the book is a vehicle to do that. And that's certainly true for me. Um, so I, I was trying to wrestle with my own ideas. Um, this book is, uh, frankly, the second book in my own mind as a part of a trilogy. Um, the first one that I wrote, that was the f that I consider the first in the trilogy, is called A Christianity Worth Believing. And there's one chapter where I talk about Jesus and God a little bit in a way that I kind of liked, um, and I sort of pulled a, I sort of pulled back in that chapter. It, um, it was a bit more memoir than this book. It was about my own sort of exploration, how I got into Christianity as somebody who grew up without any religious background at all. But I, I could tell when I wrote that book that there was a missing section. What do we do about this notion of God as it's embedded in the life of Jesus? What do we do there? So this book was taking that idea the next one. Then I've just finished the third book in this trilogy, um, and it's called Outdoing Jesus, uh, Seven Ways to Live the Promise of Greater Than. And it focuses on Jesus' comment in the Gospel of John that those who believe in me will do even greater works, will do the works I'm doing and doing even greater works than these. So what does it mean, I tried to wrestle with, the idea that Jesus is the starting gun for a new way of humanity to live in the world and use the seven miracles in the Gospel of John as a frame for how humanity is meant to live. Um, so I've, I've got a Jesus thing kind of going on, right? And a Jesus and God thing. And those are, um, those are big issues that when I uh, entered into Christianity, I was, a, I was a teenager, almost 17 years old. I had no religious background at all. So my introduction to Jesus and to the Gospels and to God in a Christian sense was uh, as a late teenager, early adult. That's really important for me because that meant that I didn't have a childhood version of Jesus that I had to reconcile. There, there, there wasn't a, um, there wasn't a um, fourth grade version, a five-year-old version. Uh, my grandmother told it to me this way. My parents said it like that. I like to say I get to think about Jesus without feeling like I'm insulting my grandmother. Which is a really hard thing because our faith is often, especially if it's a family faith, and I worry about this for my own children, like they're 29, 28, 27, and almost 26, um, and they grew up with parents that like talked about this stuff all the time. So any version of Jesus, God, spirituality, Christianity that they experience gets mitigated through the life of our family growing up, and that's, you know. Uh, it's not fair or unfair, it's just different. So I, I didn't have that, I didn't have that going into all this. Um, uh, I, I'm a bit of a contrarian, and contrarians, if, if you know that uh, way of leading in the world, um, contrarians are often seen as troublemakers. Uh, I don't think contrarians are troublemakers. I think contrarians are trying to keep people out of trouble. I think the person that raises their hand after the last amen, the person who says, yeah, but also, uh, and what about this? And um, I have a friend named Peter Wohler, who some of you might know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. Peter and I have been friends for a really long time, like way even before uh, I was in Christianity, maybe before he was, I don't know, but we, uh, we were in high school at the same time and played on, on competing basketball teams against each other. So when we met in our early 20s, we, so anyway, we've known each other a long time. Pete, Peter has this, this great phrase where he talks about the work that they do for, with Source Ministries. Uh, and he said, uh, he grew up going to church a lot. And he said, I always worried about the second and fourth verses, why they, uh, he would say, uh, the, the song leader would, maybe they're calling you now too. Maybe somebody hunting both of us down. Um, he'd say the song leader would get up and say, uh, let's, let's sing the first and third verses. Yeah. And then he'd always say, what's in the second and fourth verse, right? Like what's right. being left out? I get into Christianity when people uh, with a group called the Navigators were, uh, were around and doing a lot of, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I, I memorized. Are they still around? Oh, yeah. Still doing their good navigating? Mm -hmm. And Bible verse packs they would yeah. give you. And you carry this little pack with cards, and then you'd pull the card out, you'd say the verse name and the verse reference, and then you'd read the verse. Yeah. And so I memorized Bible verses. And I always wondered, like, okay, uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, for all scriptures inspired by God and therefore profitable for correction, for teaching and training in righteousness. What's verse 17? What was verse 15? 
Like any time you pluck something out of the middle, what was around it? What, that, that was always curious to me, far more interesting to me than the, than the passage itself. Um, so that's sort of a temperament, right? Um, and then I have also come to believe that Jesus and the Jesus gospel is bigger, more expansive, and more inclusive, and I would even put it in a political term, more progressive than I am. There's almost no level to which I could be as progressive as Jesus or the Apostle Paul. Like, I think the Christian story that's proclaimed in the Gospels and through the writings of Paul and the book of Acts, if we could catch up to that, like I think it's great that we have a church that's fully inclusive, right? So uh, across the spectrum of sexuality, LGBTQ plus uh, peoples and all. Uh, but when Paul comes out you know, a couple thousand years ago and says that in Christ there is no male or female, no Jew or Gentile, no slave or free, like, Paul goes full-on non-binary, no male or female, 2,000 years ago, right? We're just trying to catch up to that. We uh, almost, you know, bend our elbow, break our elbows, patting ourselves on the back for having a non-gender-specific bathroom. Like, the gospel says that we shouldn't first start by separating each other into two groups of males and females. Like, so the gospels and the call of Christianity wants humanity to be freed from its self-imposed and others-imposed limitations, and um, the, the, the passage, as you know, because the one that sort of flipped me first, uh, well, it was Jesus' notion that you've heard it said, but I say to you, right? I, I don't think I used the word contrarian in there, but boy, that's, that's the ultimate contrarian uh, sort of attitude. Like, I know you've heard this, but there's also that, right? It's just so wonderful. And Jesus' provocative call for whatever you've experienced at one point or whatever humanity or your religion has experienced, there's something more. We're not, we're not done. To me, that's the heart of whether it's led by a, a flame by night and you know, by, the, by the cloud by day for the, for the Jewish community or Jesus says the spirit blows where it, will, where it wills and we follow. Uh, or Paul says, um, where, wherever the spirit of Christ leads you, you should go. Like th There is something sort of moving in the story of, of Christianity and spirituality. And I rebuff a little bit the, the notion of orthodoxy um, that's used as a boundary as opposed to used as a fuel. Like if our orthodoxy and the teaching we've had becomes the fuel in our system to move us forward, it's fantastic. Like, look at the way people thought about this. Look at the things they struggled with. Look at the way they pursued the world. Oh, it's so good. But if it becomes, no, people already decided. It's already been settled. The explanation is, um, is clear. Like, I don't think any church, and I, I've, I'm around and, and try, to, try to engage myself with people across the spectrum of how open or, or uh, settled people find issues of spirituality. And even in the most conservative or settled kinds of places, nobody bother, nobody's bothered by a question. In fact, no, no pastor I've ever met is bothered by a question. I mean, we might say that they're bothered by questions, but they're not. You could, you could raise your hand in the middle of a sermon and ask a question. Some. Leaders don't <laughs> care about questions. What they care about is if you disagree with the answer. <laughs> right? Yeah. This is where the hang-up comes. Questions are great. That's how we learn. But what if you disagree with the answer to the question? That's when the trouble starts. And I think it's essential that we always hold any of our answers with the right level of humility that um, it's a suggestion of how it could be. Well, and not the subtle that. fact. Yes? If you hold it that way, mm -hmm. then it can be questioned. Then my question is, this other, God is not other. Yeah. I, then that means whoever I meet is okay. Yeah. I have a question about that. Yeah. Because I, uh, I've met people, I don't know if I can give illustrations now, but the other in them is not loving, mm -hmm. for example. If I see love, I can see Christ in that person. Yeah. But if it's not there, I can't. Yeah. And so, 
everybody is not right. In other words, mm -hmm. at least from my discernment. Yeah. Now, that's one thing. And then this thing that God is other. Yeah. There's more to me. There's more than me. In other words, I know God's in me. I, I, I can hear him. I know he's here. I know he needs me. But when I look at the cosmos, when I look at the microcosm, mm -hmm. with this incredible beauty and this incredible, awesome idea that goes on beyond my a capability of thinking, that's not me. In other words, God is other. Yeah. Hmm. And I want, I want, I question that here. Yeah. yeah. I question that you, uh, you kind of jumped to, if I can remember. Somebody help me. <laughs> the jump. You're doing great. Yeah. You, you, yeah. You, yeah. You've, you've stated it really yeah. well. In, yeah. The in God, we live and move and have our being. And I make an argument God's not a, a yeah, separate. When you, when you say that, you go, you talk about God not being other. Mm -hmm. It is, a, he is other for mm -hmm. me. Yeah. I have nothing to respond to if he's not other. Mm -hmm. In other words, I have no, nobody to talk to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I'm all alone. And and there's for me that that just can't be. There's gotta be a separation. Hmm. Okay, can can I can I respond to that? Th thank, thank you. you yeah. Thank you for that. And that's I mean, as you know, because I launched the book with that and finished the book with that, like that's the center of it. Um it raises this really interesting ontological question or nature of being. What's the, what's the logic of the being of things? Um, and we always operate as human beings with these metaphors. Uh, I, I like to say the problem in English is rarely the verbs and the nouns. It's almost always the prepositions. The prepositions get us in trouble. And the I'm prepositions... Be careful. Okay, here we go. Great. I can tell you're a linguist. Because the word is... The, the big hang-up on the word is in. So... Every Christian I know uh, is comfortable saying God is in me. And they don't really struggle with that, what it means to have God in them. It, they sort of say it and fills them uh, and they I move. I don't even agree with that. <laughs> that they say God is in them? Not everybody says God is in me. No. Uh, the uh, same understanding. Yeah, well, maybe not with the same understanding. And, and this is what I'm getting at. It becomes a question about what do you mean by in. It's rarely about the question of God or the question of me. It's a question about what do we mean by in or indwelling. So this is where our work is, right? This is, this is the theological project. This is what Paul was pushing at. This is what Jesus is, is pushing for. When G and Jesus does this really wonderful thing where he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me and I am in you. And as it is with me and the Father, so it is with you. He's doing something with this notion of connectedness or interconnectedness. And that functional metaphor is what uh, I try to step out and say, I think what Jesus was getting at, what Paul was getting at, if I could put it into a modern day parlance, it would be not expressed most thoroughly in God is in me, but I am in God. Yeah, I understood that. Okay. And when you are in God, because there is no boundary to God. Now, this doesn't mean things are not distinct. And... It's something I don't, uh, I've spent a little bit, a couple of sentences here and there about the difference bet between something being distinct and separate. So just as a metaphor, it's very, it's very uh, 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 easy for us to understand that my finger is distinct from my spleen, but they're not separate or they're not separate in a way that I would say, well, my spleen is me, my finger, no. But they are distinct. I mean, they're distinct. They're, they're separate in space. They're separate in function. I could take my spleen out and keep my finger. I could cut my finger off and keep my spleen. But functionally, uh, in my life, if I start to say there is a me that's not my spleen, it's not my finger, I could start to dissemble myself down to the point that you have to ask this really deep question, well, what is you? 
At what point, what is it that makes up a you? Well, I, and I think a lot of us, uh, you know, the, for some, these are not fun questions, but boy, for some of us, this becomes a really interesting question. Am I my thoughts? Am I my behavior? Am I my actions? Am I my beliefs? Am I my body? Well, in some ways, yes, those are all you. But are they the totality of you? No. It, 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 when someone behaves evil, are they evil? When someone behaves good, are they good? These become uh, categories of uh, description and understanding of ourselves that push the human being, that, because all of us live sort of in a specific location, knowing that we've taken on the biology of our, of our heritage, we've taken on the genetics, we've taken on the energies perhaps, we've taken on the teachings. Most of the things that make all of us up are a collection of that which has been given to us, our language, our words, our body, our physical makeup, all of this. We're, we're, we're the beneficiaries of inheritance much more than we are the self-creating uh, uh, features. So in that, we are sort of connected to one another. I think what Jesus is getting at when he says, um, be one as the Father and I are one. That's a kind of recognize your, your full oneness, even though you are distinct. But distinct does not mean separate and doesn't mean different. And now it can, sometimes, and people might want to argue for that. And look, Christianity has made its, uh, has made its hay on separation and distinction narratives. The separation narrative of God. Uh, in the, in that uh, first book that I mentioned, I, I, t I tell a story of how I got into Christianity. And um, it, was at the, it was downtown in, in, Mini in, South, in Minneapolis at the, what's now the State Theater. And back in the early 1980s, it Jesus was people. the Jesus People Church. Yeah, yeah well, there you go. Well, uh, it, you, you might remember that it was April 1st, 1983. It was a Friday uh, before Easter that they had a uh, passion play. Passion play was a common thing that they, that they ran there. Uh, that, that was my introduction to Christianity. So I know nothing about Christianity at all. I go to this passion play with a friend of mine. I literally don't even know what a passion play is. It was, frankly, a bit of a bait and switch when I got there and realized that it was a passion play. And it was, you know, it's a big, that's a, that's a very specific use of the term. Uh, yeah, the passion, right? Um, so, so we get to the, uh, we go, and I don't know anything about Christianity at all. Uh, really, uh, zero. And I see the story of Jesus and I see the story of God and the story of God and humanity playing out in the life of Jesus and that God is not separate from humanity and that the play out of, of Jesus is to invite people in and Jesus is, is beaten and I knew what it was like to feel that kind of rejection and Jesus was abused and I understood that and Jesus was uh, one of God and... That can be a little confusing. He was accused by the religious people of being the wrong one, and yet he was the promised one. The resurrection happens after Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, that forgiveness is the response to violence, not more violence. Mm -hmm. It's a revolutionary story. So my heart bursts open. They do an altar call. They say, come on, you know, come on down if, if you want this to be your thing. I swear I was the first one out of my seat, right? Mm -hmm. I have no idea what an altar call is. I don't know what's happening, but I'm like, that's the story I want in on. And so in that case, it was great that they did it right out and, you know, made you come right to the stage where all this was happening. So I go down to the stage, they gather us up and they uh, brought us backstage, which is kind of cool uh, at the start. And then we sat in these little circles. There were lots of little circles, maybe about as many as, of us as we have. And they handed out these tracks. And we start going through a track and all of a sudden, all the passion, all the people, all the prayer, all the engagement that I saw on the stage gets turned into steps and stages. Okay, so I'm figuring this out. I'm, I'm, I'm into the Christian story for six minutes at this point, right? And I'm trying to figure this out. And we're going through the booklet. And we get to this page that has a, a, a drawing of a canyon. And it has God on one side of the canyon and humanity on the other side of the canyon. And I thought to myself... Did you people see the play that they did out on the stage out there? Because in that play, they said the fullness of God dwelled in Christ Jesus. That's the, that's the call of the gospel, the fullness of God. You know, Philippians 2, the fullness of God dwells in Christ Jesus. What's, what's this business? Okay, now they're working a metaphor. Fair enough. 
But that metaphor is, in my view, uh, I think inaccurate if you take the Christian gospel as, as your storyline. So I wonder, like, I can understand why the human being is trapped on one's far side of the canyon, but why is the all-powerful God trapped on the far side of a canyon? Right? Like, does it make sense? Though? Like, theologically? And I don't know. I don't know anything. And I just thought, okay, that's not the story that I saw. The story that I saw was that the separation that I believed exists between me and God and was being portrayed in this booklet, that's the fiction. What I need to do is to wake up to the spirit of God that has been beckoning, calling me, and holding me all the time. That what I needed to do is have eyes to see and ears to hear. What I needed to do was to respond to the spirit that calls. So you needed to respond. I needed to, I, yeah, I needed that, to. That was one of our questions. I needed to. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, yeah, I needed yeah, to respond and to reorganize and to reorganize my life. Not to change the, the, the nature of my relationship with God. To change the nature of my relationship with myself. How many times has that changed? Say, say again, just for the... How many times has that changed? Uh, I, Since that first time. I think continuously, honestly. Um, I think it's it's daily, to borrow the Apostle Paul's phrase. How um, can you not change if you're asked? I mean, how do you... Yeah. How, how does that play out? Do you have a choice of not changing? Oh yeah, yeah, really? yeah. You always have. I, I think you always have a choice. I think human agency, at least in, if you know, for your typical person for whom the the mind uh, and the brain are, are working well, um, I think you you often <clears throat> uh, you you always have agency. Um, and and I, I compare some of this, and I think I can't remember if I do this in the book or not. Um, but the 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 relationship you have with yourself is a really good indicator for a way to think about how you relate to God. You can have a very broken relationship with yourself. You can lie to yourself. You can abuse yourself. You can deny yourself. You can talk badly about yourself. You can talk well about yourself. You can heal yourself. You can love yourself. Now, not because you're separate from yourself. In fact, the, it's only possible because you're not separate from yourself that you can do all those things. Mm-hmm. So that which we, can, we experience in our own selves, this is why Paul uses the, the metaphor of the body. He's not talking in some big broad sense. He's like, no, that thing you do in and with yourself, don't say the hand is separate from the foot. And live in such a way that you're full and integrated with yourself. So can you violate yourself? Yes, you can. I mean, look, if we were, uh, if, if you started to a real serious uh, practice of thinking about how you thought about yourself over the last three months, you could probably chronicle a number of times where you've been tempted to or have said things or thought things about yourself you would never say about someone else. We can live with such enmity toward ourselves that we never would towards someone else. I think this is key to understanding how we live with God. The true, I I have to have a relationship with my wife, whose birthday is today, and with my children, and with that nice guy. Does anybody speak Spanish? Huh? A little bit. It's a couple of times. Do you speak Spanish? Sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. Not enough. To Who is that? I don't know. That was my Sorry. Pete. No problem. It's Pete. Um, mm-hmm. Pete. Um, he needs to speak Spanish. Husband. Husband. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, so anyway, uh, so I, I think he did. I won't belabor the point any further. But the, no, it's, not, it's a psychological disorder when you split yourself into different personalities, right? We, we, have, we have terms for that. It's a, it's a, it's a breaking of the, of, the, of the psychological structure. I don't want to go so far as to say it's that similar with God, but I might sneak up to that line without exactly saying that, right? If we continue to talk about God as other and not as that which we are part of and is part of us so that there's oneness, then the call to be unified, the call to be held, the call to be uh, in um, becomes something, uh, something really different. So in some ways, you know, it's kind of a philosophical question and conversation, but boy, I mean, if you go to a therapist, if you go to a, a, a holistic doctor, if you go to a hypnosis, a hypnotist, if you, go, you go to anybody that sort of works with the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the unconscious mind, right? Three categories that we apply to 
our modern day uh, way of dividing the mind, which are probably not the greatest categories. There, there might be, you know, years from now we might find seven different categories rather than three. But there, anyway, there's a lot going on. But if we think that we are separate from ourselves, if we think we're separate from our past, if you think you're separate from your future, the old me, the now me, the future me, well, in some ways you can talk about those distinctly. You know, I've changed a lot. and I'm not the person I was when I slept out in the parking lot out here. I'm a different person now. But not totally, right? So this is the question for all of us about who, who are we and how are we? And our question's about, is the cosmos really separate from us? Are we separate from it? And what's the nature? Uh, what's the nature of relationship? But look, uh, it's a, it's a very fair argument, and and I I um I, I think there's a lot of people who would, for a lot of reasons, would have a better sense of Christian spirituality if God was a separate being that they had to relate to through a mediator. Um, but boy, I think like the book of of Hebrews does this real. It tries really hard to say, don't think about that. There's some mediator between us and God. Jesus is the final mediator that brings it all together. Right? He's trying to remove mediator, and Jesus is trying to get rid of sacrifice narratives, and like they're they're trying to take these hard uh, uh, hard wired notions of separation and distinction, and to help us to understand the interconnectedness of all things. That's why when Jesus says, when you love and care for someone who's in prison, when you care for the least of these, you've also done it to me. Now you can turn that just into morality. You can turn that into some kind of moral scorekeeping of credit. Sure, of course, people do that. I've done that for a long time. But I think Jesus is getting at something more. I think Jesus is actually getting at the, the you that you think you're doing is not separate from the one you're caring for and is not separate from Jesus and is not separate from God. And for me, it really helps me to sort of reconcile the, the hard divisions that uh, exist in Christian spirituality between, uh, you know, God, Jesus, the Spirit, and humanity. Um, I, that's essentially what this book is trying to, you know, sort of nudge people, uh, nudge people towards a more integrated view of it. All right, so that was a long, long answer to a, to a an, an unsatisfactory answer uh, for some people, I'm sure, to a... a well, can I... <clears throat> I have a list here for, that is collected from the group, so these questions are not just coming from me. Joanne asked one of them just now. Um, but to maybe put a, even more kind of flesh on that question, I think what our group has kept coming back to is, so what is the... Um, what do you think about evil and suffering then? And where does that yeah. fit in this? But, I mean, isn't picture? that really the question? Like, it never comes up. I don't raise it in the book, but I'll tell you, every conversation I've had about this book and every group experience, it, it, wh whether it's the first question people ask, it's the one they're waiting to ask. Mm -hmm. Where then is evil? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> um, it become, uh, for me, the, the big shift, the reason I got comfortable writing this book and saying these things, the way I try to say them and flipped, is if we start to believe that evil is something else and other, we miss it all together. I think this is what the Jewish tradition teaches about God. I think it's what Jesus tries to teach, that evil and good do not sit opposite to each other, they sit with one another. And the capacity we have to do good and the capacity that we have to do evil. They don't, um, they don't fight each other. They live with each other. Yin-yang. Yin-yang. That's an Eastern, that's, uh, I don't know what tradition specifically yin-yang is, but they're together. If you know that yin-yang symbol, it's you know, sort of that swirl and the swirl. And then there's a dot of each uh, color inside the other. The, the book of Genesis is what really throws me on all of this, right? And th I mean, this is, this is the third grader in Sunday school class. Like, hey, why is there a serpent in the garden, mm -hmm. right? Sort of question one. Be and, and it strikes some of us odd because we want evil to be other. And we want other to be evil. The thing Jesus does is he says, look, you try to put all that evil out there, you try to put all that evil on her. You try to put all that evil on cool. him. Where? 
On, on some other person, no, on some other thing. No, quotes in the Bible that Jesus says that. Oh, when, when, that. yeah. So, so when Jesus says, um, you condemn this woman for, uh, for, her, uh, for her adultery. And he bends down on the ground, he writes, and then he stands up and he says, but I say to you, those of you who look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already. Where does it start? It's you. You, the righteous, are also the betrayers of the righteous. Don't miss that, he says, right? He says to the woman, go and leave your life of sin. Not you are sin. Leave it. Like the, the, one of the big questions for us... Just to, that you are sin. That it's part of you. It's part of you, and, you've, and, and so then the question becomes, do you deal with it? Do you live with it, or does it overcome you? The, the way James puts it in the book of James is really great. The, the, the sin that so easily entraps us. Thinking about it as an entrapment, as slavery. The Jewish tradition, the Jesus tradition, the early church tradition is that sin is seen as slavery that puts us in bondage and damages us. We tend to put sin into the category of morality or evil as opposed to entrapment and slavery and damage that requires freedom and healing and life. So the alternative to sin is always life. The alternative to sin is not some sort of punishment. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. When, and, th- and that's Jesus' response to you know the idea that he's a son of the devil. <laughs> right? he's like, mm. I was going to ask you about Romans. I you know I I do what I don't want to do, yeah. and and I don't do what I know I'd like to do. And then the next verse, yeah. there is no condemnation yes. in those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, there's no condemnation. So Paul's whole argument is get rid of condemnation. Now, some people will say, no, the whole clause of that hangs on for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Um, and I think what Paul is getting at is when you recognize that this is the story you are in, condemnation has to go. You cannot be condemning or condemning of yourself or others when you're in Christ Jesus. That's the, thing. That's the paradigm shift. How That's do you the flip. Jesus? What you're saying is you're already in. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Everybody. Everybody's already in. Yeah. So the man that murders me is in Christ Jesus. Yes, the man that murders you is in Christ Jesus. So when he violates you, he violates Christ Jesus. When he violates humanity, he violates God. Is this the distinct thing? Okay, can you clarify? You used that word, but I didn't Here, see it. it. Clarify the distinct thing, because that was the word that pivoted that changed everything and I'm starting to buy into what you're saying because of that word Mm. and I didn't see it in there but clarify this discussion with the word yeah can can I make yeah thank you for that and can can I make a little commentary about why it's not in there this this is why when I brought up all that rambling at the beginning about why would you write a book and do it in this format when you're working with an editor an editor and my editor is the, the best that I've ever met she's she's incredible she would constantly say like if you saw versions of this book in its early time, like I go into all that kind of stuff, and she's like, "Look, you got to make your point and go. You cannot sit there and try to guess every thought because I'm sort of like that, right? My mind sort of works in this thought bubble kind of way. She's like, "You cannot be spinning around on all that. Make your point, go. Trust your reader. This is this is on them to push back." So had I uh, uh, not taken her right advice and made a book entirely too long that you never would have bought because it would have been un- intolerable, I would have made a big, a big point about the idea that the, the person that does wrong is also the person that can do good. Boy, when you, I mean, I'll tell you what. Now, now th- that is a really, really hard thing for people to recognize, to fully humanize every person that does evil. And to not sell ourselves and to not believe, well, they're not even human. I hear it all the time. When that young man went in and killed those kindergarten kids in Newtown, all the people saying he's not even human is the response we want to give. The truth of it is, yes, he is human. Even the full beloved child of God can do such things. Can I, can I be real provocative for a minute about that? You talk to families in Afghanistan or Iraq about soldiers from the U.S. military that have killed their families, 
and believe that they're Christians and that you would hold to their Christian commitments and their Christian life, that reminds you that a fully beloved child of God can be a murderer. Now you can say, I think that's justified murder. But I don't think you unchristianize that soldier, fired that rifle, launched that missile, dropped that bomb. Are, are, are murderers Christians and are Christians murderers? Do people who bring evil, are they people that are, y- yes. So once you do that, once you make that, that recognition that in your tradition and faith, this person is a beloved one of God, that's when it starts to open that maybe beloved ones of God can do such things. And then once that exception becomes possible for one, I think it starts to become the storyline for all. And this is the big, this is what I think Jesus' big opening is. That's why he's always trying to say, I've seen this faith in the Gentile. I've seen this faith in the soldier. I've seen this faith in the Samaritan. That thing that you set these boundaries that kept all those people out, I see that very faith in them. That idea to a Jew was so provocative. Right? Jesus at the well with the woman and Jesus uh, healing the soldier's uh, child, daughter in one story, a son in another. Engaging, fraternizing with the enemy. I mean, all of this is because Jesus is like, this is not how God sees it. To, to Jesus, the, the, the rain and the sun fall on the just and the unjust alike, for that's how God is. And then that's the passage in which Jesus says, so you should be like your heavenly father in love. Love to all without distinction, because the love of God is on all. Boy, I, so, okay, one category of this is universalism, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm so uninterested in universalism. I mean, it's fine, whatever people want to do, I'm not, I'm not going to pick a fight about it. That really has to do with who goes to heaven or not. I'm, that's actually not an interesting conversation to me. Um, I'm an inism, right? Uh, if you're in God, that becomes the question. But you can be in God. You can be, have a great life with God. You can have a great uh, spiritual experience with God and still wreak havoc and damage on this planet, on other people, and on yourself. Jesus' is called to love God, to love your neighbor as you love yourself and your enemy is not um, uh, uh, something that's only available to the select few who cross a precipice. It's the call to all of humanity. Because Jesus, I think, is saying that's what that that's what you're humanly capable of because this is what God is. And the difference we love to make a big difference between God and humanity it really gets messed up when you try to teach you know eighth grade uh, uh, catechism or eighth grade uh, you know class that you are like, well, Jesus is God, but then also human, and how is that possible? And you're like, well, it just is. And in outdoing Jesus, I make this big argument that that which we say about Jesus, we're, we're compelled to say about one another. In fact, it doesn't do us much good to say this about Jesus and then to deny it from one another. That if Jesus is the, is the beloved child of God and you're not, I think we've denied the beloved child of Godness of Jesus. That's what I think Jesus tries to teach. So, um, so, so this is the distinct question, right? Is Are we distinct from ourselves when we abuse ourselves? No, we're not separate from ourselves. Are we treating ourselves like another? Absolutely. Okay. Now, the right thing to do is to recognize that we are not another, that we are us, that we that I am me. Now, I mean, you start sounding like Yoda in you know right. a, in a Star Wars episode or something. But I, if, if if I don't believe that I am me, even when I harm me, mm-hmm. and I start to think, well, no, that was another side. And look, we've all tried to figure this out. Like, I don't know, is there a little? Something over here? Is there a little angel over here? Is there a little temptation out here? Like, is it out there? And true spirituality, I think, drives us into, no, 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 that's all, that's all me. Okay, so um, I was, in thinking about what you're saying, I'm, my mind is is triggered to think, um, like Paul was talking about, and Jesus, certainly, the, the, the Jewish view, which is more monistic than the Greco-Roman, which is more dualistic, separation of body and 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 spirit, um, or are they are they calling humanity back to more of a Jude- Jewish view of of integrating the person, but then the other thing about, the big thing about the other that 
I I am willing to go along with what you're saying to a certain extent. <laughs> sure, but, yeah. but the thing but that careful. I need with the other is um, knowing that God is all right. So I'm going to qualify it too. Is sovereign. And I would tell my kids whenever they thought something was unfair and they were crying, I'd say, you know, Jesus holds all your tears in a little bottle because <laughs> yeah. they all matter to him. Yeah. Um, and that's how I reconcile the sovereignty of God with, you know, the hurting God with me. Yeah. And, and I am not willing to give up the other when I, in, in, in discussing the idea of God because I need something bigger than myself, bigger than all the evil in the world that can set me free. Yeah. That looks above and, and sees the pain that I'm going through and says, Branch, it's because I've got a greater glory for you down the road. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and to, the promise of that is what I need the other for, not to put it on another human being or even myself, because I want to be an integrated person I want to be a whole person. I don't want to have a part of my life saying, "Oh, well, this is this is devoid of God." Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's. That, I think you said it so well. That that's the dilemma we all have. Like we we want to be fully integrated, mm -hmm. and yet we want this sense that God is more than me, mm -hmm. and that's the whole point of inness. That's why you don't make God a separate a separate uh, uh, a single separate subject being. This is why the Jews would have not let you name God, because you can only name that which you possess. But the Shema of God is not that there's one God. It's that, hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. Now, we've tended to hear that as, 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 mon, as, as a monast, as a monotheistic, thank you, as a monotheistic way of seeing God, that there's one God. That's not what the Shema of God from Exodus says in Deuteronomy. It says, the Lord your God is one. One with what? It's not just that God's not split up into lots of little gods. It's that there's everywhere you go. This is what the psalmists bring out, you know, in the last chapter, that no matter if I go to the height or to the depth, or, there's nowhere you can go. The greatness of the sovereignty of God is that there's, there's no boundary to God. So if you go there, you're in God. If you go here, you're in God. If you go there in your thoughts, you're in you, the you will always be as close to God as you are right now, as close as your breath. There's nowhere you could go to be further away or closer. So live in that reality. But it's bigger. Of course it's bigger. It's bigger than me. Of course, absolutely it's bigger than me. It's not just you. No one is saying, I mean, at least I'm not saying that, oh, the totality of God is you. But at the same time, you. He's other. I wouldn't say other. <laughs> this, yeah. this is a question of semantics. That sounds yeah, like but, but semantics, yeah. as, as a good linguist will tell you, semantics are simply the word clues you use to get to the idea and the concept. So, I mean, as a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a semantic fiend on this stuff. Um, but even, even the, all of the descriptors we use, bigger, closer, better, in, these are all simply comparisons that a lot of times our English language doesn't allow us the kind of depth of um, engagement. But. So, look, n almost all Trinitarian thinking Christians would say, Jesus, fully God, fully human. Just hold that thought for a minute, right? And then would say about you, you're not. Jesus was, you're not. You know, and then the eighth grade kid's just like, okay, come on now. How does that, right? If you start thinking that through. Now, if you say that which was true in Jesus is also true in you, and that's what Jesus' call is, that you would see that Jesus is the brother of humanity in the family of God. And this is what Jesus' primary teaching is. Don't, don't think of me as different and as others. That's why you're going to do the work I'm doing. That's why I'm sending you to go. That's why you're going to be the ones that follow. That's why I'm going to go so the Spirit can come. Because it's better that way. Because you're all part of this now. That's the story of Christianity. Not that one time, one place, for 33 years, one person had an experience of fullness with God that you don't have. I mean, 
That's not the greatest of news, right? And then if you think the right things about who that person was, then you get partial access to, that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, where I'm going, you're going to go. Where I go, you follow. That which is true of me is true of you. In my father's house, there are many rooms. If it wasn't so, I would have told you. Like where I'm going to be there, you will be with me also. This is the thing that Jesus is up to, is I'm in God, you're in God, now let's live like it. This whole thing really compels a person to live up to the things that God calls us to live up to. At least I hope. I mean, that was sort of the, what you asked earlier about, like, what was the point of the book? Or the audience was one thing. The point was to call people up and to not allow us to have this, like, well, there's this and there's this. So this separation is what gives me the option to be free. Um, in some ways, the, the, the gospel strikes people as like, wow, I'm deeply implicated here. If I'm in God, there's nothing I can hide from God. Even though we all talk about hiding things from God, like for the love of it all, people talk about that. We think we're hiding things. And then somebody says, God sees everything you do. Or better yet, God holds every tear you've ever cried. Don't worry that God didn't see this. You know, children often see God through the lens of how they see their parents, and they know their parents don't see everything. It's not a greatest metaphor for kids. They need a God that's more present than their parents. I would, I would argue they need a God that's more present than the other. They need a God that is um, fully uh, holding and, and all. So, anyway. Okay. So, that's kind of one idea, right? Evil. What do you do with evil? Where does evil come from? And, um, I mean, it's, it's curious, isn't it, that, that of all the things Jesus doesn't talk about, where evil comes from isn't one of them. Don't you just kind of wonder that? Like, why do the Gospels not have Jesus just kind of explaining where evil comes from? Instead, every time it comes up, Jesus pushes this thing and says, you know what you probably ought to consider is you and your neighbor and your enemy. Not where does evil come from. Even on the, the, the time when they walk by the man who's on the ground, he's been there since he was uh, a child because he was born blind, and the disciples ask that really famous question, Lord, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Of course, the response is, neither. This is so the glory of God could be revealed. Don't see these things through a sin narrative. See these things through a freedom and life narrative. Be freed. That's... Do you all want me to harp on the question of evil, or should we move on to the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me put it, uh, yeah. Uh, I have more I'll, questions, I'll, yeah, but okay, that's okay. what, yeah. I mean. Yeah, do another question. It, I mean. I mean, I can stay on evil all day, because I would, I would just simply ask, okay, in the, in the construct of other, where does evil come from? Well, now you've, got to, now you've got to invent an entire cosmos in which there are sub-evils, and those evils are not part of God, but then what are they doing in the world, and how does God interact with them, and how come Jesus could be affected by evil, but then therefore not evil, and if, it's, if, if he can be affected by it, then how's it? Like, it, it all, it's, it's super thorny. Um, part of the reason that I think we need to base evil not in other, but in us, is because that's the only way we're ever going to get free from it. In fact, any harm you've ever done to yourself or to others or any work you've done with people who move from doing harm to themselves or others to freedom from that, they begin to recognize that it was never out there. It was always in here. But what about suffering? We have chosen to suffer. We have chosen yeah. to suffer. So I would say God suffers. Like the, yeah, but I suffer. And God suffers. Suffering and, and, th and life are not separate from one another. I mean, this is, the, uh, this is the, also the Christian argument, right? That suffering is not something that we should avoid. And, and I don't mean you should just, like, just sort of go out and get yourself beat up for no, for no good reason. But that in suffering, we find the fullness of the life and care of God. You know, it's, it's just, that's why Jesus is presented as the suffering servant, Right? Jesus is suffering as the, as the beloved one of God for whom the fullness of God dwells in, suffers. So suffering and separation from God are not the, the storyline we're supposed to be telling. Suffering and cared by God is the storyline that we're supposed to be telling. This is what's manifest in Jesus. But what, what people often, and this, this comes up a lot. I, re, I remember when I was doing a conversation about heaven and hell. And I was, there's a debate, this kind of formal debate that kind of helps you clarify ideas like 
some uh, another person would give an uh, presentation, and then I would give a rebuttal, and then I would give a presentation in front of a group. And it dawned on me in the midst of this when I was trying to say that the notion of hell was something imported into the gospel stories of Jesus, not something that comes from the gospel stories of Jesus, and that the gospel stories of Jesus want us to leave that behind. Uh, I, I realized, sort of sitting there, of the comments of, of uh, this Chris, who was the other debater, that he was beginning to hear that I was saying God was not going to do anything about the wrong that had happened to him. That when he hears there's no hell, he, me- he hears there's no justice. Yeah. Yeah, that was yeah. my question. It's, in my view, it's precisely the opposite. That when evil and suffering and injustice happens in God, God has to deal with it. If God is a separate other character that then has to be called into our suffering, then there's got to be some mitigation about deciding is this the suffering or evil or wrong that God's going to do something about. If all of it's happening in God, if within God there is evil that happens, if within God there is suffering and pain that happens, then God has to deal with such evil. And such suffering. It's not that we are dependent, uh, that we're, we're, we're needed to beseech God, to call God on behalf of that, and to get God in here. Like somebody came in and said, does anyone speak Spanish? Because I need you to go out there where Spanish needs to be spoken. Instead, the rescue is not in here and the pain out there. The rescue in God and the pain in humanity. That those things are held together. I think that's a better way to know and to trust that God is with us and is on our side separation narrative would say, well, maybe there's a place where there's God and there is no suffering and then God doesn't really understand this. But we all know that's not what the Gospels teach. From Hebrews, you know, right through the Gospels, it's, it's all telling us that no, 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 the fullness of suffering is understood by God through Jesus. That's the, that's the good news, that the suffering of God is never missed by, or that the suffering of humanity is never missed by God. It can't be. It's impossible for it to be. So know that God is with you. Boy, I think that's good news. I mean, uh, so for me, I'm trying to wrestle with this. Like, if God's outside the door, if God's over there. I got to get God in here, or I got to get over there. And this getting places and getting people places, moving an item from place B, place A to point B, is really complicated. And um, so, you know, we, and we've set up lots of systems to deliver. You know, uh, when will it come? How long? Oh, I mean, this is a great. Okay, so I'm really ranting here. But, you know, if, if, if you read, like, the book yeah. of Micah or you read the book of Habakkuk, how long, oh, Lord, must I wait? And what's the answer? I'm already there. Mm. Yeah. All the prophets yell, how long? When? When? Don't you see? Mm-hmm. So th- th- that's why I think the shift in, um, okay, and, and I'm not suggesting that the human experience, that the human being inside of this body with this set of, of, of cells and mind and all is the, is the, the limit to God. I, there's not a great metaphor for this other than, I don't know, like every, um, every proton and electron and neutron that's ever existed in the world is just being rearranged all the time. It's kind of interesting. Like I'm not a reincarnationist, but it's kind of interesting to think... Uh, you know, that, that which was part of Jesus' physical body, you have some part of that. Like, it's all just moving around here. There's Nothing's being added, nothing's being lost. It's always being rearranged. Well, that starts to, that starts to open some, some sensibilities about past, present, and future, um, and w- which I really think is a problem. Like, an infinity loop is probably a better imagery for life than a, than a, a start, middle, and destination. Um, Because we sort of understand that reality in a better way. And that this is the life of God. And there's, you know, sounds terrible. There's no getting out. And there's no need to get in. What there is, is a requirement to see, to live, and to be. To go and leave a life of sin. And to live a life of fullness. And if you don't? And if you don't, then you stay entrapped. You stay in bondage. This is why the Exodus narrative is so big. Moses comes and says, they're not going to listen to me. And God's like, well, well, tell them I I sent you. He's like, well, who are you? Well, I am. All right. So he goes and he calls the people out of bondage. Well, what if they had stayed? Well, then they get into the wilderness years for 40 years and they stay in bondage. 
They keep making, and then the prophets and the kings tell them later, you're staying in bondage. You continue to, and then Jesus comes along and says, just like the Exodus called you out, you continue to stay. Why are you staying? Right. So the implication of not leaving is you continue to, 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 to live under, the, under the, the effect of it. So be freed from it. But do you have a choice to be freed from it? In, in some ways. Yeah, in some ways. But if we think that life is sin, which a lot of people do, they just think like life and pleasure. You know, you, you get a real long sin list going. Um, and, and I don't think sin is a list of things you do. I think it's a, it's a, it's a description of an entrapment. But look, I mean, it's, it's really complicated stuff. We probably need another couple thousand years for people to chase these ideas out, right, so they can really develop. Because this is really hard stuff for human, humanity to understand itself. And Christianity's contribution is in a pretty thin sliver of the human experience. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not talking about everything. It talks about some things. And I think its big thing is to try to argue that God is um, always... Like, always is a really great phrase to me. God is always. All right, what else? Gosh, I don't know where to go. <laughs> we're we're going to run out of time. Um, but that's okay. Yeah, we can do that. I um, Talk to us about the crucifixion and what, what Jesus is all about. I mean, that's a big question. Yeah. Uh, let me narrow that down. Yeah, what do you what need Jesus for in this from story, right? This yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. book was a lot this discussion of transactions and needing a mediator or an adapter to get to God. And if that's not the idea, then clearly you're not someone who believes that the sacrifice of Jesus mediated something for us, or maybe, I don't know, I'm not going to answer for you, but it left us with the question yeah. so, how do you understand the crucifixion? And how do you understand the sacrifice of Jesus the and the resurrection of mm -hmm. Jesus? We also have like questions about grace and forgiveness and confession. All that stuff, yeah. Things, so. Yeah, look, Christianity has been built around a transactional process from beginning to end. So a lot of us have been taught that grace and forgiveness and freedom are all, are all results of a, of a particular transaction. And if you click... I've never believed that. You haven't? Mm -mm. I'm so She's thrilled to hear that. Only. I am so yeah. thrilled to hear that. I, I, I never Joanne is the one who's turning my ideas on their heads yeah. all the time. Because it's <laughs> devastating. It's devastating when you do. It's it, when you feel that there's some user agreement you have to click on in order to, you know, uh, download the app of forgiveness. It's just, it's, it's just mind-bendingly damaging. And and some of the Christian teachings, as as they've landed on some people, have really affected those people really. Did you get really that? Really harshly. Did yeah, you? I just was appreciating his usual audience <laughs> with your analogy of the user agreement. And <laughs> your downloading an app. Oh, yeah. All these phones. Uh, people, it's, 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 especially with all the new privacy policies. Everywhere you go on the internet or on anything, there's just somebody's clicking some dang user agreement or some credit card comes. Do you still have questions? Oh, Yes, I have more curiosities than questions. What, one of the things that's developed in me is that I've tried to, for me, questions, just for me, the way I frame a question, um, questions are about interrogation. Right. Curiosity is about um, exploration. And I'm more interested in being curious and sometimes to be curious, you have to drop your questions because questions put a demand on you and on the thing you're questioning to stay here. Let's, let's get it. Let's, let's answer the question. Get it right. oh. Curiosity, on the other hand, is like, I don't know. What is that? What, what's the? Whoa. No, no, and, I, I don't mean that. I think we're into semantics. But to have the answer. OK, I've got my answer now. Now I've got my answer. I can never be in that certitude. There's always another not quite satisfactory answer yeah. that I need more or I'm looking for more. And maybe you call that curiosity. I think that that might be a semantic. Well, no, I think, I think they're different. Like, I think sometimes people can just say, like, uh, one question leads, one answer to a question leads to another question. And they're staying in a question modality. Which I get. That's my that's my temperament. My temperament is to be questioning and question answer. There's another way of dealing with ideas, which is curiosity. They're different to me. 
They're not semantic differences. They're not, these are not synonyms as much as they are different approaches. Um, questioning feels more like, I'm going to Los Angeles today. Curiosity is more like, I'm going on a walk today. One of them is destination-oriented, and one of them is doing-oriented, processing-oriented. I'm working myself really hard to get my Christianity out of my questioning mode because I know that my questions are already framed by a whole set of assumptions that my curiosity is trying to broaden. So when questions come up, I try to sort of deal with them and say, what would be the more curious way to think about this idea more than what's the right question and the right answer? I, for me, now some people can do their questions and answers where they're like, I started with this question and ended up with this answer way over here. I'm not, I for a lot of people, that's really, un, that's really unsensible. When I say quick questions, I mean uncertainty. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's yes, what certitude I mean. is, I mean, if, if you picked up anything from the book, I hope you, you picked up. The idea that what I try to push for is a level of confidence that people can live in. And the thing that crushes confidence is certitude. Certitude is the opposite of confidence. Um, being confident in something is, I think I can live, I, I, I can move forward now. Okay, let's go. Certitude is this pursuit of something where you're certain. And man, the myth of certainty Anybody know Dan Taylor from Bethel uh, College? He wrote a book, a great book, affected me so deeply a few years ago, or 30 years ago, called The Myth of Certainty. And it was just so freeing because you're like, oh, well, even your cert certainty is only in the right set of conditions. If exactly the right question is answered, then this or question is asked, then this answer sort of, sort of fits. So yeah, I, I think that um, all of these things that I say in the book and all this, these are suggestions of a way to see this. These are, um, these are flips. You know, I try to make the argument at the beginning of the book that the flipping, once it starts, it never stops. You just keep flipping it over and I was like, and then there's that, and then there's that, and then there's that. And I think a more curious mind um, that we can all develop uh, helps us keep going on those flips. Because anytime we, we hit something where we're like, no, I think this is, this is pretty much the only way you could say that. Um, but it, look, ideas and spirituality is meant to serve humanity, right? One of the big push that I make in the book is the Sabbath was made to benefit humanity, not humanity for the Sabbath. Questions, doctrine, ideas, teachings, they're meant to benefit us. We're not meant to fall under their, under their sway. They're meant to serve us. Right? We're, we, so if something works for someone and helps them get along, whether you think about that through stages of faith or stages of moral development, boy, like you need to have a storyline where, where God uh, sort of suck, uh, saved you from something you couldn't save yourself from. Because that's a developmental understanding. And then you start to realize, oh, no, God invites me to help to heal the world. I'm now, I become one of the saviors in the world. I become a saver. And, oh, even for myself. And, oh, I've been partnering with God the whole time. God's always been my partner in this. It's never been just, just that or this. So, I, yeah, I, I think questions and, and a lack of of. The, the degree to which questions drive someone away from certainty is great. For some people, though, their questions are in a pursuit of certainty. They're, they're asking questions or holding questions or pursuing questions to get to certainty, to get to L.A., not to go on a walk. And, and I go to L.A., so like I have answers for things, like, okay, this and this and this and this. You know, but you hold those really loosely, it, it seems to me. Um, like if you were around our church, they'd be like, oh, Doug just said it seems to me again. Like, it seems to me is our version of amen. Um, because it seems to me is, I know it should be embedded that that's what someone's saying, right? You make a declarative statement, and like, yeah, that was you making that statement, right? Like, you, you weren't identifying something that exists for all time in humanity, and you just happened to name it. You gave your perspective on something. Well, they can have a lot of confidence in perspectives, uh, is it, is, it ever, is it ever certain? I should probably. Dangerous when it is, or, or dangerous wrong. Lack, uh, unuseful when it is. Oh, I that oh my, we've got three of you. No, no, we're oh. grabbing for it for her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. um, it seems to me, is this one? You know, it's running is out this of thing Here, you can use oh. this one. Okay. Well, it seems to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> 
Um, I had to write this down because the one thing for me that I got out of your book was it helped me clarify some of my own struggles with my faith and what do or I believe and what don't I believe. Mm -hmm. Do I need all the answers? And for me, it seems to me that I don't need all the answers, that I don't need that certainty. I've gotten to that place in my life. Uh, but what I do need is to just rest in the knowing that God loves me. And for me, that's the confidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, it. and it's really helped, your book has helped me to more clearly speak about my own faith and my own belief, even though I don't agree with it. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. All the better. All the better. Like, like that's probably the, the, perfect, uh, the perfect description between the certainty of questions and the, and the usefulness of confidence, right? It helped me even though I don't agree with it. That's perfect. I mean, I feel that way about lots of things. Friends, the Bible, Donald Trump. Uh, like, it just, it, you just have to be like, okay, well, it's either going to, you know, make me find me and grow and be full uh, or not, you know, and agreeing with something. Well, I mean, in all honesty, to read something that you already agree with, what a waste of time that was. Like, you're already there. What? I mean, that's like, I don't know, it's like flipping through old old uh, photo albums and not thinking new thoughts about those photos. Like, of course you should think think newly about them in a little... Hey, what would you think about that bit about uh, uh, Elohim and Yahweh on the sacrifice of, of Isaac and Abraham? Mm. God, that was my favorite bit. <laughs> yeah. I have notes from that. Yeah? <laughs> I mean, I solved the whole Abraham-Isaac problem in one, one, one quick chapter. Yeah, that was I said that with a smile. No, it was. That, that, that the call to sacrifice Isaac was a test to see if he would uh, return to the God of Elohim that demanded sacrifice instead of the God so of Yahweh never that calls heard it off. Anybody address? Um, will it work for me? Turn it back on again. It's got a little bit of juice left if we just keep pushing the power button. Right here. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you can do it. Did I? It'll light up. You have to hold it down for a second. No. There you go. Okay, great. No, okay. I've never heard. No, no, it's working now. It's working. I've, oh, I've never. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> Don't project. Don't bridge. Okay, I've never heard anybody address the different words used in the text within that context, and. It was eye-opening, that's for sure. But why, why is it that we've heard so much about that and people never address that, if in fact that is so? Do you want, uh, so here's, here's what I, what I, th what do you think? I, I really do think it, it's because our societies that have held Judaism and Christianity want to be sure that we preserve the notion of human sacrifice. And the reason we need to preserve human sacrifice is so that we can call some people to be our sacrificial lambs. Predominantly so we can kill other people. If, if, you, were, if, if you follow the Jewish narrative that, that of you know, the prophets, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, um, does not desire sacrifice. If you follow the prophets saying, how, how, many, how, many, how many animals would you kill? How many? The, uh, the Lord does not desire sacrifice, but desires mercy. If you buy that from the Jewish context and buy that in the Jesus context, and you take the crucifixion not as God executing Jesus, but as God returning to life that which humans executed. The crucifixion of Jesus is the, and the resurrection of Jesus is the greatest condemnation of capital punishment and war that you could ever have. You cannot kill your way. The reason the resurrection matters is not because the blood of God, would, the blood that God desired, was appeased. It's because the blood of, that humanity desired was seen as ridiculous. Yep. The resurrection is to mock. This is why Paul says the cross is a mockery of the powers of this world that want to kill and destroy. It mocks them. It 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 flaunts it in front of them. If you buy that story that we do not sacrifice. The church can't call for crusades. 
You can't burn a heretic. You can't excommunicate a person. You can't kill a criminal. You, you have to stop treating people as if they're not human and they're others because they're part of a sacrificial system. So much of our abusive world is built around the notion of sacrifice. And the difference between sacrifice and suffering is enormous. We're called to suffer. We're not called to sacrifice. When Jesus says, hear, think again what the prophet says, that God does not desire sacrifice. I cannot tell you the number of Christians who will argue with me, and they'll say, you're just being semantic. I'm like, uh, maybe, but God doesn't do require sacrifice. Well, I'm supposed to sacrifice. I'm supposed to sacrifice for my kids, for my faith, for my spouse, for my world. No, you're not. There's no sacrificing anymore. God brings an end to, to sacrificing by bringing Jesus to life. Calls it off. It's useless. That's the, that's the proclamation of resurrection. For people for whom it's God needed blood, God got blood, just like God wants blood from, from Isaac. Oh, okay, well, that's why I think the whole, the reason I think the, the people in the New Testament uh, in Hebrews lift up Abraham as the father of the faith of Jesus is because he calls off sacrifice. Right? So Yahweh calls off sacrifice. Elohim calls for sacrifice. Yahweh calls it off. Are you going to be a child of Elohim calling for sacrifice or Yahweh? This has been before the Jewish community and before the Christian community for millennia. And it faces us today. Are we going to be those who pursue sacrifice or not? Thank you for your sacrifice, soldier. I feel like we should apologize to soldiers who had to go sacrifice their lives and say this was wrong and we're sorry. We're sorry that we put you in this place and we thought this was the only way we could get there. As if war and killing one another is inevitable. It's, um, so why do I think we don't hear about that? <laughs> because it's so politically provocative uh, that if you bring an end to sacrifice, I'm telling you, the whole thing comes crumbling down. I have to stay here and work longer. I have to give up on my... I mean, just all the things that we bury into a sacrifice narrative, even for ourselves, no pain, no gain. I, sh I have to suffer a little bit. Why am I suffering now? Because that thing that I did, like God's going to demand some sort of a payment and judgment. This whole transactional sacrificial system, it's... it's um, and, and funny enough, it's the very thing I think Jesus came to abolish, and yet it's the thing that the followers of Jesus continue to propagate. It's like Freaky Friday. We're doing the opposite of what the gospel is. It's just, it is, it is truly remarkable that we're not implicated by uh, the call to end sacrificial stories. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think I write in the book, no, no society performs human sacrifices anymore. At least we've moved away from those ceremonies. Instead, we do set sacrifices and other civic engagements, um, especially around our criminal justice system and around war. The, the note that I have here. And the border. Oh, and the border. And the border. Oh, the border. Yeah. I mean, uh, just I mean, just think about the immorality of a policy that says let's punish children and parents so that people won't come. Sacrifice them so we'll stop being bothered with having to deal with people from Central America. It couldn't be more unjust. It couldn't be more opposite Jesus. And I'm not saying you should even let them in. I do think you should let them in. I think our borders should be open. Full, full stop. Set, but this idea that you would punish someone so that someone else would learn a lesson, that is immoral at the deepest, deepest of levels. Whether it's Republican or Trumpism or, or, or Democrats or not, I don't care. It's immoral. And we do it all the time. We punish other people to change the behavior of a third person. I'm going to execute you for a crime, put you in jail, strip you from your house so that other people won't do it. That's pretty much the notion of sacrifice. You pay the price so that they don't have to. What the? Are, what, are, what are we talking about? Well, fortunately, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That they don't know what they're doing is they're just totally, you know, it's a shit show, Jesus would probably say. Like, this is horrible. Nobody get it. This whole thing is wind spinning out of control. Forgive them. They're, they're all wound up in this thing. Let's get out of this. I think that's the, that's, that's the, that's the gospel story. So, may I turn it back on? Hey, I can hand it to you. It's okay. So, would, do you see a place for people um, 
sacrifice, I'm not thinking of like killing sacrifice, but the idea of that I choose to mm -hmm. deny myself mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. for the greater benefit of somebody else, or would you just not call it sacrifice? I mean, to me, that's a type of sacrifice. I'm denying my own Versus living in a pleasure or whatever, self-interest or, self or selfishness because I want something to be better for somebody else. Yeah, it's probably the colloquialism, as you'd call that, a sacrifice. Yeah. Um, I think we probably shouldn't use that term. Okay, that's I, I think of that. like surrender. So sometimes I think if I, I'm going to, I surrender this, it's a willingness of a surrender. But my motive is not necessarily for the benefit of someone else. It's mostly because I know that if I do that, the, the joy is going to be more full within myself or yes. within that's all true. things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's almost a sense of which when someone's doing it willingly, the, and, and it's deferred gratification or giving on behalf of another, that that's not a sacrifice. In fact, anyone who does something really gracious or kind, like you say, I'm going to give up my house so that a refugee family can come in. I'm going to go to Guatemala to build houses so people can have safety there. And someone says, well, that's such a great sacrifice. You're like, yeah, no, not really. Like, it was a, it was a contribution and a gift. And sure, it took a lot from me. And sure, I didn't get something else. But that's not really what, but what we've wanted to do is to baptize sacrifice as a good thing. Yeah. So we, we, we keep giving it this other, uh, this, the, this, this other help. I, I really think fundamentally, that's why if people don't bring it up, I try to bring it up, the sacrifice narrative. And I'm glad you brought up the question of the crucifixion because Jesus as the final sacrifice doesn't mean like well, God finally was appeased and could rest with a full belly. It means... Um, it's it's now put away. It's now done. We're, can we now finally... Because if you think that sacrificial narrative is only going to kill the bad guys, if you think it's only going to kill the evil, the, the benefit of the Catholic Church keeping a crucifix with Jesus on it is, this is what we will do. We will kill the very child of God. This system, it will kill the beloved one of God. You think it's designed to only kill the bad guys? Well, there ain't no good guys and there ain't no bad guys. There's only you and me and we just disagree. It's a song from the 1970s. <laughs> and what we're going to do is we're going to crucify the wrong person every single time. So that's why the scandal of the cross is the scandal that we killed the wrong person and yet life came anyway. When we attribute the, the, the cross to being God's delivering of, of the thing God always wanted... I, I, we're just we're telling another story altogether. I don't know what story it is. But did you have something? Uh, you might have to. I will. I do this one. I think it. I was just. Yeah, I think we use the word sacrifice too broadly. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. and what I think you're talking about is, I'm going to stop myself from actually hoarding. Mm. Um. Which I would say is the op, like the opposite of sacrifice, right? Because you're, you're hoarding is gathering more resources than you need. And so we often say that not hoarding is a sacrifice. It's really about generosity. And yeah, I mean, it's... Being generous. Yeah, because on oh, my mind about school stuff and integration, it's like, well, as white people, privileged people, we hoard all the resources. So we're like, well, my school needs these extra computers because we have plenty working computers, but we still need more when the school down the road doesn't yeah. have them. like, And so then to be like, well, we don't actually need these extra computers, so we'll, we'll donate them. And this is a sacrifice for us. It's not a sacrifice. It's just not yeah. as hoarding as much resources. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we definitely need to change our thinking about that word that word, and and all the broader implications of that. We'll pick the real zingers. <laughs> we started with evil, uh, the, yeah. the premise of uh, in God, and uh, the crucifixion of Jesus. So, so let's get to the tough ones. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the circle ones we kind of got too. Um, yeah, I mean, we talked about God being an other too. I'm still really cranky about that, but that's okay. We don't have to go there. <laughs> And and not because I I I think in spirit I agree with um, the idea, um, but it's really hard. And Bridget kind of hit on this. Okay. It feels um, lonely almost to think that 
God is not an other that I relate to, but instead something that I'm kind of maybe he's an other in. like your finger versus your spleen, right? And I and it's some of this is kind of it's kind of coming together with this conversation, so I'm just going to let that I mean, one yeah, sit no, for a while. I, I, um, in some ways, we and you've probably heard this before. When as we read through this, we said, "How is this different from? How is this different from Buddhism? How is this?" not sort of universalist or God is everything. Um, yeah, yeah, God is a ground of being and all. I don't think it is different. I think okay. it's uh, I think it's a way I think there's 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 access that cultures that gave us Buddhism or gave us ground of being thought, the philosophical approach, American philosophical approach that gave us God is ground of being, Thoreau kind of stuff. Uh, I, I think that that captures something that are a lot of our Western Augustinian version of Christianity drove out on purpose. But I believe that the reason we Christianity was reframed around a separation narrative between us and God is allows us to separate humans from humans. You have to do that. If, you, if we're going to be different enough that you can be an other that I can kill and sacrifice, or you can be enough that I can exclude, then I need a narrative by which that matches the character of God. Humanity's always wanting to match whatever the universe, cosmos, ground of being, energy is, God, is with how we live. We, we just tend to do that. We're pattern recognizers. So if you can say, well, God sees you as different from you, then I have to do the same thing. And if I can see God as separate from me, I'm off the God hook. Now, Jesus is a bit of a problem, theologically, but I don't know. We'll deal with that sort of as a doctrine. Or as a one-off or something. But then the gospel doesn't let you do that because the gospel keeps saying, no, that's, that's, you're, you're not going to get to just separate all that, that which God does not separate. Right? So that's, um, but I think there's real reasons. There's, there's a cultural description. I mean, I was really glad to hear you talk about the Greco-Roman world in which they used uh, 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 separate that other book that I mentioned, that's basically what it goes through, is trying to describe this Greco-Roman worldview versus the, the worldview that Jesus has. And if we could recapture that. And the fact that other people on the planet have also seen the oneness of God, yeah, that's really great. But I think Jesus' call and the call of the Gospels is unique to the other, God, the, the other presentations of how people view the world. Like, I'm not not a Buddhist, but I'm not a Buddhist because I'm a Jesusist. Like, and as a Jesusist, following the teachings in the way of Jesus, I incorporate that stuff too. It feels like I get all that plus an ethical call, plus a reimagining and a, and a real active nonviolent call. Um, now, Thich Nhat Hanh, who does this, runs a program for uh, Buddhism called uh, Engaged Buddhism, is pretty great um like that's that's that starts to nudge right up uh to me to the to the teachings of jesus but i hope my teachings follow the teachings of jesus like that's um i i don't think christianity has to be again wholly other from all the others and if any other tradition teaches something we have to say well make sure that's not in christianity as if only christianity's version of the world can can describe that which is right or accurate or you know on, on mark or something um, but I think it is really di I think Jesus's call is really different than than some of the other faiths and religions um, it's just not another, always in great ways but it's how, just how another it example of the false dichotomy that we love as Westerners yeah. yep mm -hmm. did you say the false dichotomy yeah yeah like what, what are you thinking of so as Westerners we love to have a false dich can you hear me Joanne <laughs> This one's out. It's totally out. I'm sorry. I brought dead batteries. Um, to replace the dead batteries. We've talked about this Just throw my garbage. That's what you do at home. So Just the, throw them in the especially as white Western people, our perspective, we love the false dichotomy. Yeah. So we love, that's why all of our political arguments go into anti or pro. Yeah. So you're anti or pro death penalty, you're anti or pro abortion, you're anti or pro yeah. whatever. We just, that's how we love to frame everything is that false dichotomy. So we, done that with Christianity and we're like, well, if we're going to be Christian, then we can't be Buddhist or we can't be Muslim or we can't. And so even though there's a lot of traditional practices that cross over from the beginning, yeah. we've weeded those practices out or put a different 
spin on them so that it doesn't look the same or feel the same. Yeah. Because, oh no, that slippery slope, if you do that and it's too close to them, then you might just slide right down and become yeah. something different but with no like ability to stop yourself or change or whatever. You know, the lightning bolt will come down and strike you and suddenly you will be 180 degrees different from what you were yeah. before. That's really insightful. You know, the difference between the word and and or is really powerful. If you can and... Some, and it, with, you know, 50 years ago, you probably all wouldn't have said with the level of confidence you did, like, well, I, I know we're in this church, but like, it's not really my, or I go to another church, or for a while I went to another church. It used to be that going to another church was a real thing, right? Lutherans didn't marry Catholics, Catholics didn't marry Presbyterians, Presbyterians didn't learn from Methodists. But now we've sort of been like, okay, if you're Christian, good enough. Protestant. Right? Protestant, maybe, or some Catholics, or maybe a little Orthodox, or, yeah. right? So we're sneaking there. And then somebody else says, well, what about Jewish thought? Okay, Jews, yes. If you're Jewish and Christian, okay. and then, okay, Islam, because then, you know, at least they're, you know, part of the Abrahamic, the Abrahamic faith. And then, right, okay, so again, when the exception, once the exception happens, the rule looks ridiculous. So... Jesus is a humanist in that sense, not in our modern day humanist. Maybe it would have been, I don't know. But like he was like, humanity is the thing. We're not going to talk about the kingdom of David for Jesus. We're not going to talk about the kingdom of Caesar. We're going to talk about the kingdom of God. Jesus elevating it to the kingdom of God rather than the tribes and the kingdom of David and the, uh, the Gentile kingdom of Caesar was to say there's a larger kingdom that which is the kingdom of God which God we were going to refer to as the father and in this family is all of humanity of which I'm the big brother that's the gospel that that which you're going to separate Jesus is going to put into the hole wow okay well that on what basis well the sun rises and falls on the just and the unjust alike and as God loves them so should you be perfect in your love as the heavenly father is perfect in love like this okay so you're supposed to live like your father you're supposed to be in the family of all of humanity not separating out humanity Jews and Gentiles there's no slave no 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 free no Jew no Gentile no male no female like that's the story and then we'll continue to divide that up for sure we will as a dog returns to his vomit vomit the prophets say so will the fool repeat their folly? So we'll just go back and we'll create a separation narrative and a sacrifice narrative and, a, and an othering narrative and all that. And um, so it's a lot of work. And there's something, I think, biological in us that kind of wants to create that. I think we have to rise above our, bio our biology. Um, we're, we're not just animalistic survivors. Love uh, The way a person can love their child is more than what evolution requires. So what is that? It's more than just survival. It's thriving and fullness of life. And wow, what do we, how do we get to that? Boy, that's, but that's, that's a, I know for a lot of people that all lands as a really different version of the gospel. Um, uh, but this is why I think Jesus uses fathery language um, and refers to God as the father because he's trying to contrast God the father from Abraham the father. That's, that's what's always coming up. You might know those fights happen in the New Testament where Jesus will be like, well, our father is Abraham. And Jesus is like, I want to tell you, your father is God. It's one step above even Abraham. Because they try to say we're from the kingdom of David and we're from the kingdom of Abraham. Then he wants to go back to Adam. Then Jesus wants to go back to God. God's the, So we're all in that family. Draw that family line back to everyone. Now, is that universalism? No, because universalism is trying to argue about who gets to go to a place called heaven. Uh, Kind of uninterested in that, in that oh, question. I was going to ask you about, oh, you're uninterested, but I'm wondering about afterlife. I know, you're not interested in No, I'm what, really interested in afterlife, not very interested in heaven. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, yeah, what do you think about afterlife? Well, I, I, as the best anyone can sort of make a guess, I would assume that the afterlife is, uh, after this life is going to somehow resemble something of this life, some way for it to have any meaning to us in this life. If it's so you know, functionally distinct, and then, I don't know, all bets are off. Who really, who cares, right? Um, I mean, whatever that's going to be is going to be something that doesn't matter if we think about it now because it's so totally not this. Um, so it seems to me that, that something of this life carries on. Uh, and the way you think about what makes this life life is that which is going to carry on. 
I'm pretty sure it's not going to be our molecules. Even in some kind of a resurrection. I think the resurrection, if people hold it, the resurrection of Jesus was not just, Jesus' resurrection was not a resuscitation. Lazarus was a resuscitation. Guy was dead, guy's not dead, guy's going to be dead again. Jesus' resurrection is not that. Yeah. He's un, he's, he's, he looks different, he feels different, he's other dimensional. So in whatever this other dimensionalness is of resurrection, um, what, what we do here, I think, continues on. So in the sense that your experiences from your childhood and from your younger life continue to influence you now, I think that whatever for life force there is that is you carries on and, and continues. Now, shockingly, there's, other than an occasional near-death experience, there's nobody, even in the Gospels or in uh, the Jewish scriptures, that give us any indication about what happens after life. They're, they just seem to be uninterested in answering that question. I mean, save up a, 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 an appearance on a mountain, you know, of Elijah and uh, and um, and Moses or something. They, they, there's just there's it's not that doesn't seem to be where the focus is, which is really curious. Like they were very interested at the time of Jesus in afterlife stuff. Who do you get married to? Who doesn't? Is there a resurrection from the dead? Like that was all in the in the parlance. And the Christian tradition just picks up very little of that to carry over. It's really, it's really curious. So I think we're just into more speculative thought about what that could be. I don't think it's very well informed by our Christian tradition. But I think it's going to have something to do with what, whatever life is now. And I think thinking about that kind of helps us think about what life is now. Like what really is life here? What are we doing? What, what is this? thing that we call life that's going to carry on what some people call the soul maybe i i don't know um but the soul i can't get soul out of my mind from like a ghost so and the ghost is always like a apparitional version of this and i'm not totally sure you know so i don't know so so i think we're really in the dark uh on on that but there's probably other other dimensions maybe other realities you know we we know so little about electromagnetism we know so little about dark matter in the universe we know so little about what sort of makes up the the cosmos that um and i really like how paul would say stuff like hey make sure you like have your houses open for one another because people have been entertaining angels unaware <laughs> you know like i just love that kind of idea like i don't know like servers, people who serve God, maybe on this plane and others sort of hang around. It's just such an interesting way to think about a non-physical only nature of spirit. I think Christianity's greatest threat is, um, well, current day republicanism is probably the greatest threat to it. But <laughs> secondly from that, it's, it's, it's probably not the spiritual practices and spiritual traditions. It's the attraction so many of us have to biological evolutionary theory of the world. Chemistry and biology and evolution, which I'm fully into. I'm full, like evolution is real, 100%. But our biological explanation of our humanity does not go far enough and explain who we are. And we could regress ourselves down into a biological only narrative that's not very helpful. Um, something about what it is to be alive. If you've ever been with someone when they've passed, and I've been with many people when they've crossed over, there's some, that energy when the heart stops and the brain wave stops, something, that, that's a thing. It's a supernatural. It is. It is. Yeah, and it is. Um, so what was that? And that's not just the bones, and it's not just, and so then you start to hear the gospel writers and Paul saying things like, you know, it's not, it's not flesh and bones. Um, yeah. Jesus said, to, you know, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which some smart kid always says. So then in the Apostles' Creed, it says that he went to, he descended into Hades for three days. So what's, what's that day thing, right? <laughs> right. That kid, I love that kid. Yeah. Good glass, you know, uh, picks up on both those things. Like, hmm. Yeah, and what's a day? Uh, I have a friend named Riley Powell. She's a great spiritual teacher. And she, she uh, recognizes that in the biblical term day, whether it's in Genesis or the day of the Lord, means the reality. The, the, in the new reality, you will be with me. That this is the day. This is the, the seed. This is the, the, it's, it's, really, it's really quite great. And that that which Jesus experiences, you experience. Like sometimes when I'm on one of those rants about non-distinction, non 
uh, non, non separation distinction stuff. I do this thing about when Jesus says to the person on the cross, you know, you, you, you will be with me. That thing that whatever happened to Jesus has also happened to that other guy. Don't talk about it as if what's happening to Jesus is a singular event for only one person in humanity. Fortunately, the Gospels give us a hint that's in there. So I think the Gospels are really the key to all this stuff and, and a Gospel uh, and even a first century church orientation of Christianity, I think would do us a lot of good. I think it's super provocative and trying to keep up with it is just really, really hard. I mean, it's, it's so, so rich and it's just been flattened out so much by, not so much by our teachers and only our pastors or preachers or official people, but just kind of by all of us. Like, like we kind of keep, I don't know, we all just keep knocking it down and flattening it out and, uh, taking the lumps out. So did that answer all the questions about the book? Um, <laughs> Never. Okay, how doing Jesus comes out in August, so you can start that in September or really round the circle. Because if you think this one was provocative, uh, oh man, wait till you take those take on those miracles, and that you're supposed to be in the family of God. Jesus is a big brother and the starting gun, and not the he's not the miraculous exception. He's the miraculous rule for humanity. That's really fun. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, we have to you. set our child care workers free, so yes. thank you so much. For, free them from bondage. Um, right? <laughs> for being with us today. Um, Y'all can feel free to uh, stay.